The world in general thinks much of Christmas and very little of Easter. That's unfortunate. Easter ought to be the supreme religious moment of the year because the resurrection of Jesus Christ answers the most profound, the deepest questions of modern man. And um, right now, I'd like to explore five of these profound questions. Firstly, the whole question of doubt. Doubt. You know, today people ask, how can I know which religion is the right one? The average person today faces a veritable supermarket of religions from which to choose. And he wonders, which one should I choose? It's a crucial question because on the surface, there seems to be no great difference between Christianity and the religions of the world. They all seem to have great leaders, scriptures, miracle stories, and high moral and ethical standards. So a casual shopper would assume that all religions are basically the same. Nothing could be further from the truth. There is one fundamental difference, one fact that sets Christianity forever apart from every other religious system and philosophy in the world. You go to the tombs, you go to the resting places of the founders of the great world religions, and you call the role as it were, okay? Moses, here. Muhammad, here. Buddha, here. Confucius, here. Jesus Christ, no answer. Silence, because he is not there. The tomb is empty. Jesus Christ rose from the dead as was prophesied earlier, hundreds and hundreds of years earlier. It is one of the best documented facts of history. The empty tomb answers the question of doubt. So doubt. Secondly, guilt. Guilt. Someone has said that no doctrine of the Bible is so easy to prove as the doctrine of human depravity, sin. We see the evidence all around us. Pick up a newspaper. Turn on the television. Think of the people you work with every day, or better yet, look in the mirror. The evidence is so plain that no honest person can deny it. The reason we feel guilty is because we are guilty. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no one righteous. No, not even one. The record of our failure haunts us day and night. It whispers to us in the darkness and it shames us in the light. Sin stalks the trail of every person born on planet Earth. No one, no one is born without sin. No one lives without sin, lives uh, free of sin. No one can claim to be totally free from sin. The question is not, am I a sinner? No, 
because the answer is always yes. The question is, how do I get rid of the guilt I feel in my soul? Now, let me ask you a question. Here's a question for all of us. You can unmute and, uh, and uh, answer. There are many ways in which people try to handle the guilt problem. I feel guilty. So what do I do to cover up that guilt? What do people do? Can I have some answers? Ask God to forgive our sins. Sorry? Ask God to forgive our sins. Ask God to forgive our sins. Okay. That's one way of handling the guilt problem, right? What are other ways in which normal people in the world try to handle the guilt problem? Serve those who are in need. Okay, people try to do good things, serve other people. They hope to balance the scales by being good fathers, by being good mothers. They join, um, you know, maybe the Lions Club or the Rotary Club. They contribute to community and to social causes. They feed the poor. They even feed, uh, stray, uh, feed stray animals. They try to work hard on the job, you know. They do very well in their jobs. In short, they are fine citizens who help make the world a better place. And they hope and they pray that by doing good deeds, they may find freedom, forgiveness, and a release from the guilt that they feel, uh, feel within. What are some of the other ways we try they, to? They go on a pilgrimage. They go on pilgrimages, okay? Then Some there's also self-condemnation. We yes. condemn ourselves, yeah. We condemn ourselves. We feel, yes, that terrible guilt inside. Yes. Some people become, you know, um, very religious. They become very religious. They go on pilgrimages. They do all kinds of self-inflictment of uh, suffering and wounds, etc., you know, um, they, um, you know they, they, may, they may even join a church. Yeah, they could join a church and uh, they get baptized, they get confirmed, they attend Bible studies, uh, they uh, read the Bible, they attend religious meetings. Religion for them is a way of, way to alleviate the guilt they feel. And yet we know from Jesus, that we could be very religious people, but we could be sincerely wrong pursuit of religion. Any other ways that we try to cover up our guilt? People will sacrifice goat or chicken or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, just, I just mentioned that, become very religious, sacrifice, yes. Some people try to cover their guilt through the pursuit of pleasure, pleasure. For these people, life is one non-stop party. Everything is happiness, lights, music, sound. They laugh, they eat, they talk, they post on Instagram and they keep on moving. They are in perpetual motion because they fear that if the lights are ever turned off or if the laughter stops, if the noise dies down, they'll have to face the hard, cold facts of life. That's why some people turn to alcohol, some others turn to drugs or sex and other stimulants. It's the only way they can deaden, you know, the pain, the deep inner pain that they have. Now, all these answers, there are many other answers, all these answers fall or fail because they don't deal with the root problem. And the root problem is sin. You know, if you have a cold, you treat, you, you try and treat the cold, but the problem is you can't treat the cold because the cold is a symptom of something else, which is the root problem. You got to deal with the root problem. 
And here the root problem is sin and the true moral guilt that exists between all humanity and a holy God. No one can get around that issue. You know, you can't be good enough to erase your guilt. You can't laugh enough to drown out your guilt. You can't pray enough to cover your guilt. It can't be done. Only Easter answers the problem of guilt. If Jesus is still in the tomb, then we are still in our sins. Without Easter, Good Friday isn't good. The death of Jesus forgives sins, but only the resurrection of Jesus made his death effective. Do you want forgiveness? Do you want release from your guilt? Then look to him who rose victorious and you'll find forgiveness and freedom and peace. And this forgiveness and freedom and peace is real. You don't need to keep going back to it. Okay, maybe uh, the third one, loneliness. Loneliness. Men and women across the world ask the question, where can I find a friend? How can I find someone who cares for me? Here we are amidst thousands and thousands of people. How can anyone be lonely with so many people? You know, we are the second most populous nation on the earth. And yet we have some of the loneliest people in the world in our country in India. And I'm sure that's true in many other countries too. It's, it's actually not very hard to understand actually, you know. We, we are all living in the fast lane now. We get up, we get dressed, we go to work, we come home, we, uh, we unwind, we eat supper, we watch Netflix, we go to bed, and we get up tomorrow morning and do the same thing over and over again. We live in such a fearful society that we never really get to know our neighbors. We put up fences, shrubs, and security systems to protect our privacy. People move in and out so fast that we hardly know they were there, much less that they moved away. Hundreds and thousands of people go to bed each night with burdens and cares and heavy hearts, frustrated, bored, worn out, tired, having questions with no answers, problems with no solutions, and no one, and no one they can call a close friend. Many of us know the name T.S. Eliot. Great. You know, people wonder what hell will be like. T.S. Eliot calls it the great void, the great void, the land of ugly nothingness. We might imagine it as the one place in the universe where you are utterly, totally, eternally alone. You scream, no one answers. You cry for help, but no one hears your voice. You are falling, falling, falling through the darkness. You are alone. That's why, that's what hell is like, says T.S. Eliot, the place of utter aloneness. Now, against that, you have the reality that stems from the words of Jesus. I am with you always. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. And don't forget, he made this statement after his resurrection, after he came back from the dead. If Easter did not happen, then Jesus is not with us and we are truly alone. But Jesus says to us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise. You can rest your life upon it. If you belong to him, he will never leave you. He rose from the dead and lives today 
and will be with us forever. Therefore, we are never alone, never forsaken. Fourthly, and moving on quickly, the problem of weakness, weakness. Most of us struggle with the question, how can I be the kind of person I really want to be? We struggle because despite our good intentions, despite our high ideals, we continually fall short of what we want to be. We make New Year resolutions. We keep turning over a new leaf because the old ones won't stay turned over. The pages of history are littered with the stories of men and women who dreamed big dreams and failed to accomplish them. Is there a way out of the constant cycle of defeat? For the Christian, the answer is yes. Yes, there is. Yes. How much power do you think it took to raise Christ from the dead? You know, if you translate it into, shall we say, horsepower, would it be 10,000 horsepower or 100,000 horsepower or 100,000 crow horsepower? The truth is, with all our scientific knowledge and advancement, we can't begin to even, we can't even begin to duplicate such power today. His resurrection is one of a kind event. That's real power. Just think to yourself how much power you would have if you had resurrection power. Think how strong you would be. Think how many things you could do. Think how easy it would be to overcome the nagging problems of everyday life. If you only had the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. You know something? Here's the great, glorious, earth-shattering news. You, yes, you have that power. That's right. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that resides in you today. The power to do the right, the power to do the truth, the power to do the good. You have resurrection power right now. Easter is God's answer to the problem of human weakness. Easter is God's answer to man's moral defeat. Do you know something? You can, you can love your enemy. Yes, you can turn the other cheek. You can be humble in a proud, arrogant world. Because Jesus rose from the dead, you've got all the power you need to face and conquer every single problem in your life. Fifthly, and lastly, the question of death, the most important. 4,000 years ago, Job asked this question. If a man dies, will he live again? That is the greatest of all the questions. It is the central question Easter was meant to answer. Let me ask you something. Have you ever touched a dead person, a dead body? There is no movement in the nostrils. There's no twinkle in the eye. There's no smile on the lips. Death feels terrible, unreal, unnatural, terrible. And when we stand over the body of someone, someone we love, we feel, what do we feel? We feel helpless. We feel angry. We feel defeated. We feel afraid. Death is sobering, frightening, terrifying. No wonder the Bible calls it the last enemy. No man has ever lived who hasn't trembled before the fact of how we will face death when our time comes. Will we be afraid? Will our faith stand the test? What happens when we die? 
Does Easter answer the question of death? If it doesn't, then everything else we have said is just a sham, a mockery. Let me give you one example before I finish. He was one of the most prominent of influencers of the 20th century. He was born on the 7th of November, 1918, and he died on the 21st of February, 2018. He was 99 years old when he died. And this is what he said about death. I'm reading what he wrote. Someday you will read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? I shall be more alive than I am now. I will just have changed my address. I will have gone into the presence of Almighty God. He often reminded his family and audience that someday every one of them would die. John Dunn said, there's a democracy about death. It comes equally to us all and makes us all equal when it comes. So make your peace with God now. Make your peace with your creator while you can now. A faith that doesn't help you when you are dying won't be much good when you are living. The empty tomb says he is risen. The disciples say he is risen. The empty tomb says he is risen. Yes, the church of Jesus Christ says he is risen. All creation says he is risen. Jesus has conquered our last enemy. Jesus entered the realm of death on our behalf and he came out on the other side holding the keys, the keys of death and hell in his hands. Here is the answer to the greatest question, the deepest question, the final question. All of us will face death someday. But for those who know Jesus, death holds no fear. Yes, we're not afraid of the darkness, for Jesus is the light of the world. We may die, but we won't stay dead. Jesus has the keys, and one day, He's going to come back for us. God has answered our deepest questions with the simplicity of an empty tomb. What difference does Easter make to you? The answer, it makes all the difference in the world. Let's trust him as our Lord and as our Savior. Thank you.